our waiting list is still strong and still growing. Teaching and learning continues at high levels. Even with these difficulties, our students have met almost every little C goal we have set thus far. Though we have postponed our 30th celebration, we're still planning, preparing for the day that we can share the community of how we have grown. We have successfully maintained a healthy environment for our school with the help of faculty and staff, along with the perseverance of parents and students. We have survived multiple sessions of digital days. After being the first in Taiwan to extend learning online in January, we have created better methods of digital learning for the benefit of our students. And we have even shared these methods to help other schools face these challenges. Parents and friends of KAS have helped the school with advice, procedures, precautions, so that we could better prepare for every step we take in this epidemic. KAS is also proud to be the first school to initiate the first leaders, future leaders program. We will become the best school in the world in preparing students for colleges and professional world early in high school. We'll be the first to offer the connections from high school through mentorship into after college and as they enter the professional field. We'll have the most extensive network of support system anywhere. KS is determined to set a new standard. We'll be the best school not only in Asia, but the world. With the help of parents like yourself, we're making steady and gradual improvements every year. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, next, I would like to uh, have um, bring up Dr. Pluger uh, for the annual report from the superintendent. Thank you very much. All right, well, welcome. I'm Dr. Pluger. I'm the superintendent of schools here at KAS, and I will share a lot of information and story to you uh, with you tonight. But I want to be clear that all I am is just the lucky one who gets to speak on behalf of the team, because everything I'm going to show you represents the work of a lot of people over a lot of time. And I want to start with a story about one of our students. I'm going to call her Tammy, but that's not her real name. She is, however, a real student, and her story is a real story. Uh, Tammy was a lot like a typical KS student, bright, hardworking, affable, and as a 10th grader, unsure about what her future should look like as 11th and 12th grade and going into college, unsure about IB or not, what her course may be. Well, the decision time came, and her counselor encouraged her to pursue the di diploma program, and she went for it. It was hard. Uh, she was not always motivated to do all of the work, but in the end, she was successful. But it didn't come without challenge. She was bright enough for it, but she didn't always enjoy it. However, the diploma program allowed her to take advanced music and math classes, and ultimately she was successful. And what she learned in the DP helped her get into a very rigorous, very selective university, where she dual majored in music and math. Now she's starting into grad school and her future is very bright. Now speaking of colleges, I will share with you our college acceptances for the class of 2020 a little bit later, so stay tuned for that. But we have many students like Tammy, and for them, our IB program is changing their lives for the better. As we celebrate 30 years of KS, now is a time for us to look at who we are and who we can become to be even better for our students. So in my report tonight, I'm gonna talk about where we are as a school and where we're going, and I'm gonna talk about our strategic plan, our accreditation, board goals, our mission and vision. Later you'll hear about curriculum and finance. These are all important things. But Tammy, she doesn't care about our school budget. She doesn't care about master schedule. She doesn't care about curricular alignment. She and every KAS student just deserve the best preparation for their future that any school can provide. And so that's why we have a duty to get these things right for Tammy and for every student. So tonight you're gonna to hear a little bit more about how we've done that and about how we plan to do that in the future. We have a lot to be proud of. We have great students, we have supportive parents, a very supportive board, a very supportive PTA, a world-class faculty. And we have so many people doing so many great and so many wonderful things here. And our efforts at KAS are truly a team effort because of a lot of people. 
First, let's talk about something that we know is on everybody's minds, and those are the challenges that we faced in, in recent months as a result of COVID-19. I wanna talk a little bit about our preparation. Actually, it started back in March of 2018, when for the first time, we did what has now become an annual crisis in communication training. The reason for that was because we knew that something might happen, and we wanted to be ready and have process together so that we could work quickly as a team to prepare for what needed to happen and to prepare for how we communicate that with the community. This is something we do every single year to make sure that we're always ready. Now last year in November of 2019, our learning technology office started planning for an online continuity of operations. We didn't know that COVID-19 was coming, but we wanted to be ready for a variety of things that could happen. Going up to January, on January 21st, the first confirmed case of COVID-19 was announced in Taiwan. And just five days later, our chair, Ken, and I were having a conversation to discuss appropriate action here at the school. Two days after that, we convened the response team for the first time. And with, with uh, board discussion and approval, we made the decision to go online. And we became the first school in Taiwan on January 30th to open up with online instruction. A uh, couple weeks later, we became the first school in Taiwan to bring students back to classrooms. And as you know, since that time, we've gone online and come back uh, two more times, always with an eye towards student safety. And to this point, um, and we're optimistic about the future, but also very aware of the challenges ahead. But to this point, we're still, still at zero confirmed COVID-19 cases here within our community. But this didn't happen on accident. It started with very early uh, preparation and very early action and working together with a lot of people. There was no one person that made this happen. It was a lot of people working really, really hard. And I have to give special credit to our faculty and staff, our students and our parents for doing things that they have never been asked to do. The flexibility, the hard work that's come with that that's gotten us to where we are. I also have to recognize our facilities and custodial team, if you are here on campus, at some point while you're here, they will come by disinfecting whatever is around you. They are around the clock disinfecting this campus and keeping it clean for our students. And frankly, um, none of this works without the community coming together. So um, really there are a lot of people that have, have contributed to where we are today. So let's talk about our mission and our strategic plan that we've been working through for the last three years. If you're part of the KS community, you already know our mission. We think big. It, it drives everything we do. And underneath that is our strategic plan. For the last three years, we've been following the strategic plan. And don't worry, I don't, that text is not there to read, but that's just so you can see it. Our strategic plan has three priorities. First, to strengthen literacy skills. Second, to ensure an adequate, appropriate, and articulated curriculum. And third, enhancement of citizenship skills. Now this plan and these priorities here, they finish on June 30th this year. This is the end of the plan, and they're soon going to be replaced by our school-wide action plan. And so we're gonna talk about these goals. We're gonna talk about how we performed on these goals and what's coming next. So goal number one is to strengthen literacy skills. And you'll see we have some very specific goals here. 5% higher than the world average on some very specific assessments. Not just all MAP scores, but specifically MAP reading scores, PSAT, ACT, English HL scores. I'm gonna show you the scorecard for that, but then I'll explain to you what you're actually looking at and what this means. So what you're looking at here at the top are our MAP scores from kindergarten down through grade nine, and also SAT, ACT, and our DP English HL scores. You can see some colors here. Let me tell you what those mean. Where you see green, what that means is we met our goal last year, by June 30th, 2019. We already met the goal, and we're gonna meet it again. So for example, our class of 2026 in our reading results, if you compare KAS, which is blue, with the international average, you'll see uh, five years ago, we were 5% above, then 6% above, back to five, back to five, and up to 6% now. And we're confident that we're going to continue this trend. So the goal has already been met, and uh, we expect to be even better this year. Where you see light green, you're gonna see where we are on target to meet this goal by June. So for example, the reading scores for the class of 2022. Five years ago, we were just 0.61% above the world average. And that has grown every single year 
to June 30th, 2019, where we were 4% above. So if you look at this trajectory and you look at the work we're doing, we anticipate being 5% above by June 30th this year. Where you see orange, what that means is the goal has not been yet met yet, and we're taking a look at our strategies because this is an important goal and the work moves forward. So you'll see by June 30th, 2019, reading results for this particular class uh, were not yet there. So going back to that scorecard, you can see where we are. In almost all grade levels, we've met the goal or we're going to meet that goal on time by the end of this year. When we look at the data that our colleges are looking at, our, AC, our SAT goal, we met that last year, we're gonna meet it again this year. When we look at our DP English HL, we haven't met it yet, but we are on track. Goal number two was to ensure adequate, appropriate, and articulate uh, curriculum. And let's talk about the results for that. Um, going back for a number of years, uh, this has been uh, a need for KAS, and the work is still in progress. Getting that work done really requires qualified people uh, to do that. Prior to 2017, uh, so in, sorry, in the 2017-18 year, um, at the time we did not have a curriculum coordinator or an MYP coordinator or a DP coordinator. So we spent that year really making sure that our resources were being aligned and we were managing our finances correctly so that in the 2018-19 year, we could hire an MYP, DP, AP coordinator. This year, we've expanded that role to a curriculum coordinator, and this work is now in process and moving forward, really with a focus in middle school and high school and how we can align our MYP and our DP programs to make that IB experience better for our kids. Uh, this work is in progress. It's not complete, and so you'll see this goal carry forward into our school-wide action plan. Goal number three. It's the enhancement of citizenship skills. And this goes into a couple different things. Uh, building a school-wide community culture. Promoting inclusion of all students. I mean, how do we bring our community together from all the different places they come from? Digital citizenship and service learning. I'm gonna report on some of these. I'm first gonna talk about inclusion of all students. A lot of that goes to language use. And when we think about a multilingual campus like KAS, we think about what we call the most inclusive language or the language that's the language of instruction that is in common with, with every student. And for us, that's English. And so we look at um, what we have to do to support students who might be coming into KAS that maybe don't already have that strong background in English. So there have been some changes this year, a department restructuring, and with strong administrative support, particularly at the middle school and uh, elementary level, We've really empowered teachers to do different types and different structures of work than they've done before. Um, we believe that the ultimate impact of this is going to be uh, better English, better literacy for all in a more inclusive environment. When we look at a strong school-wide culture, I'm gonna give you a perspective from students and from teachers. We'll start with teachers. Uh, low teacher turnover can indicate a strong school-wide community culture. And if you look during the time frame of our strategic plan, so 2017 forward, you'll see that our turnover is lower during that time than before. What that means is during the time of the strategic plan, teachers are staying longer than they previously did. Um, that is one indicator that can indicate a strong school-wide community culture. There are a lot of things that have happened at the student level with the house system, a lot of other efforts, but in the interest of time, I just wanna share with you some data. So let's ask our students. Um, every year we survey our students, it happens in May, each year, so when you're looking at the data for 2016, that's May 2016, May 2017. Um, parents here, you've received the survey. We survey students, we survey parents, we survey faculty. Ask them about a lot of things, like clarity of purpose. Um, if the school has high expectations for all. Uh, if, if it provides a proper learning environment. We have a lot of data, but I just wanted to share a sample with you, because it all looks a lot like this. Um, you'll see that year when our new campus opened up, and um, you know, very high perceptions, and you'll see every single year since that point, uh, we're headed in an upward, upward trend. You'll also notice that every single one of these values here is around four or five. Um, and this is just one, one data point. We, we've asked, we ask these questions to all of our students, we ask these questions to uh, parents and faculty as well, but just want to give you an idea of what that looks like. Also, with regard to our mission, 
So as our chair mentioned earlier, a lot has been canceled. But there was a lot that happened in the fall before we got there. Just a couple highlights from the year for athletics. We hosted the Acumas Volleyball Tournament. That's an international tournament that brings students from uh, several different places here to compete. And our girls were the overall champions, and our boys took second place in a very close, close game. Um, also, until the very final tournament, our boys' soccer team was undefeated. And, and there's, some, there's some questions about how that tournament proceeded, but we'll, we'll leave those alone uh, for now. The thing was, a lot of spring tournaments were canceled due to COVID-19, which is very unfortunate. But to the extent that we could, we continued practices because we know that sports season will come again. And we wanted to take uh, this challenge and make it into an opportunity so our students can be more ready. When you think about arts, uh, we had a wonderful winter concert. You can see some of the students performing there. Um, we had, had some visiting artists uh, helping our students create some, some different clay pieces that are with, with horse hair that uh, are unlike anything they've ever created before. Um, this year we had some students intern at Wei Wuying, which is the first time that they partnered with a school to do that. Um, and so we're, we're hoping that that will be the start of, um, and I'll tell you more about something that we'll tie in with in just a little bit. But we're hoping that that will continue. Um, they are interested in continuing that in future years, but at the moment, they aren't welcoming uh, our students to their space. I want to talk about WASC. So this year, we underwent our WASC reaccreditation visit, and we've been WASC accredited since the 1990s. And what that means is that the Western Association of Schools and Colleges takes a very close look at our practices and takes a close look at how we look at our own practices and gives us an accreditation that's recognizable to, uni to universities. When, when universities all over the world are looking at a high school transcript, they need a basis to understand that the program that the students have gone through is rigorous. They need to understand that it's met certain standards. And WASC accreditation is uh, one way that we accomplish this. WASC is based in California, and they primarily accredit schools uh, in California, in the United States, and um, some in Asia as well. So we recently uh, finished the accreditation visit. There's the team right there. Four were on island and one had to Zoom or whatever the conference system was uh, in from Canada due to the travel situation at the time. Just to key you in on some of the strengths that the team found, uh, they were very impressed by how the mission is embedded into our day-to-day -day school life. They were very impressed with uh, the people in the place, the faculty, staff, parents, students, uh, our campus. They were very impressed with technology and how we've integrated that into instruction. They were, uh, they were impressed with commitment, the commitment that we have to our students. They noted some areas of growth. Going back to what I talked about with our previous strategic plan, uh, curriculum. We have some more work to do in curriculum to make sure that it really benefits our students. Um, developing a program for social emotional learning and wellness. And we've spent a lot of time creating a new updated and improved child protection policy and making sure as we go forward we implement that with fidelity and we have a process to continue updating that in future years. Likewise, they want us to roll these into a school-wide action plan to drive this improvement in the years ahead. Um, they want us to make sure our school-wide learner outcomes are as embedded in our community as our mission. And they want us to take a look at resources so that we assure that compensation is competitive with regional levels and staffing needs can be addressed. So what next steps for that look like is the team will create a school-wide action plan. This will align with board goals and the KS Vision 2030 so we're all working together towards the same things because the reality is we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And we have to prioritize what makes the biggest difference for our kids, unite our efforts, and create the future that our students deserve. Also, three board goals that I want to report on. Uh, the first one is around education. And when I talked about alignment there, the board has already done that by aligning their education goals exactly with our strategic plan. So when we look at these goals here, um, there's nothing else to report because they are the same outcomes as for our strategic plan. Board goal number two 
is around resources, and that is to maintain or increase the current percentage of non-tuition revenue. So looking at ways to further uh, provide resources for students in school um, outside of tuition. So we are currently on target to maintain, um, but to increase is going to take some time, especially in light of current global circumstances. Our long-term vision and strategy for this include building out an Office of Advancement, and we'll outline some more strategy for that in the future. Uh, board goal number three is around facilities. To initiate the process and timeline for creating a KS 2030 vision and to plan by this June for increased facility use by June 2021. I want to report out specifically on that vision. Um, in the fall semester, we initiated the process to find facilitators to um, help, us, help us be successful through this. In January, we selected transformation systems to facilitate this process, and we started uh, right away. And about two weeks later, our focus was really shifted towards keeping our community uh, safe in some extreme times. So you're going to hear a lot more about these efforts as we reconvene school in the fall semester. So let's take a look at what our future looks like. This graphic here represents school enrollment from the 1993-94 school year up until today. Now, I want to be clear. There's a line here to kind of show you this demand. This is not an exact accurate trend line. It's just an illustration to show the concept. It's not the exact mathematical line. But if you take a look at the general trend of the enrollment over time, it's more or less been pretty steady for a long time, right up until 1617. And if you remember what happened in the 2016-17 year, this campus opened up. And it opened up nearly at capacity. And because we've been full ever since this building opened up, our enrollment stayed pretty much the same because we don't have anywhere else, um, any, anywhere else to grow. The demand, however, has kept growing. And so this space up here is how we've developed the largest wait list that we've ever had. That demand has continued at the same or even higher than historical rates, but our space has stayed the exact same. We're looking at ways to solve that, and one of the ways that we believe we could do that is by solving a community challenge around providing early childhood education and having more grade one through grade five classes. Um, so this is something that we're thinking about for the future. It's a concept, it's an idea, um, but it would, it would involve adding some classes at even lower grade levels and allowing us to open up more space, particularly at the elementary school where our wait lists are the largest. So that's thinking about the younger grades. And thinking about the older grades, we're really thinking a lot about how we can make our IB program more rigorous, uh, more deeper, more aligned than it's ever been. Um, the benefits of that, really, when, when students are applying for college, one of the things that the universities look for is that they've completed the most rigorous course of study um, for their college applications. Now, what you'll see up there is just um, sort of the strategic framework for the diploma program, widely recognized by schools worldwide. And our belief is that when we unify our message around what students can and should do, they really can support each other and we can support them in going further. Um, this year, we've really started the work of stronger connections among our MYP and our DP program. And this is something that um, we're going to continue well into the future. Also, Chairman Ken mentioned the KS Future Leaders Program. You may have seen in the newsletter, this is something that we just kicked off with the official signing. And we're pleased to officially announce the beginning of this. So our board of directors led in the creation of this program, and it's going to connect our students with knowledge, resources, connection, and support in the professional fields. And when I say students, I'm talking about current students, but I'm talking about alumni, people in college, people who come back. Um, part of this is strengthening um, strengthening our students, but also strengthening Taiwan and strengthening the talent pool that is able to uh, contribute to the future. There, at this time, we have a lot of interest from organizations and groups that want to get involved, and if this is something that you are interested in, please do reach out to me, please reach out to our board, and, and we'd love to connect. <clears throat> As I close out, I promised I'd show you our college acceptances. Uh, here they are for this year. It's been an incredible year. If you look at the places our students are going to university, I mean, let me get my pointer here. 
but uh, let's see. And these, these are acceptances. Uh, students will make their final decisions by May. And so uh, these are where students have been accepted, but what the matriculation list will be may look a little bit different. But you know, we have some great schools up here. Uh, Wellesley, University of Toronto, uh, University of San Francisco, University of Michigan, um, all of the UC systems, University of Denver. Let's see, let me skip over here. Brown University in Rhode Island. Um, Cal, Cal Poly, Carnegie Mellon, um, Emerson, George Washington, Johns Hopkins. Um, our students this year have been accepted to some really, really incredible places. Now, as a school, we don't compare our college acceptances to other schools. When other schools achieve great college acceptances, we're happy for them, uh, we're proud of them. What's important to us is that our graduates, year after year, get into great schools, and that uh, regardless of where they go, they're going to somewhere that fits them. Uh, our hope is that every student goes to a university that's somewhere in their list of their top three choices. So uh, this is where our students have been accepted to this year, and as we get into May, maybe a little bit later, because colleges are a little bit behind due to COVID-19, but we'll have a clear picture of uh, where they've decided to go. So I want to take this back to why this matters. I've talked about strategy, I've talked about plans and data, but let's keep in mind why this, why this is important, and it's for students like Tammy. Again, um, they don't care about the budgets, the plan. What they actually need is just the absolute best education that we can provide them. Kaohsiung American School remains a great school that has earned a great reputation around the world. Universities recognize us when our students apply and they know that our IB program is rigorous. Our seniors continue to gain acceptance to some of the top schools in the world. Our enrollment at most grade levels is full, our wait list is growing, and our focus is continual improvement for our entire education program. This doesn't happen because of any one person. Uh, we have a strong, supportive, and future-minded board of directors, and you can see uh, the things they made possible with enrollment growth, facility, academics, and stability. We have a strong PTA that's actively involved, supportive parents that want the best for their kids, smart, talented, and hardworking students. We have some of the best teachers in the world. When you think about what it takes to go from uh, just one example, when you think about what it takes to go from classroom instruction to doing something brand new and getting that started in a matter of days, um, that's really incredible. That's just a recent example of the uh, caliber of, of faculty that we have here. We have a world-class facility that's highly regarded in the international school community that, uh, and that also makes us one of the healthiest schools in Asia. So um, I appreciate your attention, but all together, what this makes is Kaohsiung American School. We think big. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello, everyone, and good evening. Um, my name is Jesse Coyle. I am the elementary school principal here at KAS, and I'd like to share with you um, some highlights from the elementary school this year. Um, I'm not gonna lie, Dr. Pluger did a great job of setting me up. Um, he really talked about strategic priority. We talked about literacy and curriculum, and really literacy has been our focus this year in elementary school. I call it the bread and butter of little children, teaching them to read. It's the most important thing we do and we're passionate about it, and we love it. And it was a joy this year to work with the teachers and really talk about it and dig into it. And the, and the ways that we looked at it was curriculum, which is our second strategic priority, and data. And I think you see a theme amongst all of us as an admin team of looking at data and how to use data to support students. So this is an example of some of our curriculum work. This is a little snippet from third grade, and it's a scope and sequence document. And scope and sequence is really what are we teaching and when are we teaching it. And here our third grade team gets together 
and they look at their units and they talk about when do they teach their units and how long do they teach their units for. Something so simple can be so powerful. And one of the things that really resonates with me with this particular work is it gets our third grade team to really collaborate and work together as a team and make common agreements on what are they gonna teach us third grade? What does it mean to be a third grade teacher and what's our content for our third grade students? And I like to call this two classes, one program. So if a student is in third grade class A or third grade class B, they're receiving the same high quality instruction and the same curriculum. So it doesn't matter which room they're in because we have one program. Now sometimes learning activities look different because people are people and they're different, but the content is the same and that's what's important. The next step in our curriculum work when we're referring to literacy is standards. So here we have, we are common, we've adopted the Common Core State Standards out of the United States. And the first thing teachers do is what we call unpack them. So they read them and they determine what do I want my students to know and be able to do. It's the foundation for all of our work, for all of our units. And what's really powerful about standards is it helps outline the sequence between the grades. This is what a kindergartner learns, and this is how we build upon it for first grade, and this is how we build upon it for second grade. So we have a plan, so we're being purposeful. We don't want to leave any gaps in our instruction. We want to make sure we're covering everything we need to be covered. And then the next part is how do we know assessment. So here, the grade level teachers sit and they look at a standard, and they're like, well, what does it mean to meet the standard? What is meeting expectations? And this is in alignment with our report card. These are report card indicators. So what does it mean to meet expectations? What does it mean to exceed? And again, this goes back to two classes, one program. So now, when you have this type of rubric and teachers are using this to grade and assess, it doesn't matter if the student's in class A or class B, the grade is the same. And they'd be receiving the grade regardless of which class they're in. And I think this is important for an elementary school and it's important for our students. And it's been a joy this year working with the teachers as they really think through this and really try to unpack it. Now, this is a work in progress. Some grade levels are at different places and this is where we'll be starting the work next year. And it's exciting work and I'm excited to dive into it. Data. Here at uh, KAS, we have a couple of different external data points and I think external data is important. It helps us kind of gauge how we're doing compared to other people. So we have map data uh, by the company NWEA and we also administer running records. And to our students who are learning English, we give the WIDA assessment, which talks about their English language development. And one of the things that we started doing is, you know, you have all this data and sometimes it can just become numbers on a page and it can feel really overwhelming. So how do we organize ourselves? How do we think together as a team? And we started creating data dashboards. And so this is just a simple model. This isn't anything super fancy. And you can see here we have three students and their complete data picture. So these are three ELL students and this is their WIDA score broken down by listening, speaking, reading, and writing. We have their MAP scores, which is reading, language usage, and math. And we have their running record, which is a reading assessment. And so we look at this as a team. So this would be to the both third grade teachers, myself and the ELL teacher. And we say to ourselves, what does this tell us about the student? What areas does the student need the greatest support in? And what are some of our next steps? So really, for me, it's all about practice. So what does today's data tell us about tomorrow's instruction? How does this translate into student learning? What do we do next? And that's the whole reason why you spend all this time and all this money giving these assessments, and we've been working on it as a team. And it's been so successful and we've been so excited about it that we're prototyping this for next year. And so this, you see, this is just a little prototype of next year of how we wanna look at all of our data for all of our students. And we wanna compare our different external data points and really have deep and rich conversations about what are our students learning and what do we need to do for them next. The bottom line is it's all about students and how do we help them learn? And how do we know where they're at and how do we know what they need next? So what I do wanna say is this has been my first year at KAS and uh, it's been really special. Uh, my spouse and I are having a great time and we're really thankful to be part of this school and to be here in Taiwan. So thank you all so much for helping us feel so welcome and so supported. And I'd now like to turn it over to the middle school principal, Mr. Barnaby Payne. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> First time speaking in a microphone and a mask. Um, um, okay, so middle school, what's happening in middle school? 
So as well in middle school, um, everything we, we do is aligned with a KAS strategic plan in terms of academic achievement and literacy, curriculum and instruction, citizenship and student support. And um, tonight I wanna spend the most time talking about student support. And this idea, especially in middle school, that's so important is how do we support all students towards the highest achievement and the big mission? So, um, so for, from my perspective, the way that we treat the students at KAS who are struggling the most is what will define us as an institution. And right now we're in a very unique period in human history. And I, when we look at our, at our students and families who are, um, well, you know, everyone has been um, impacted by what's happened through family members, through, through um, the news of the world. You know, it's been a hard time for everyone. So um, our focus has been, who do we think, who do we predict or know has been struggling the most as a result of these times and, and with our online learning platforms and with our, our current academic structures and how do we support those students? Because the theory of action is if we can take our most struggling students and help them have high achievement, then everyone in the school community is going to benefit. So um, let's talk about that. Um, so the WASC, Ben um, touched on the WASC committee visit. There was a lot of great feedback. It's my fifth time in my career um, as an administrator being um, a part of a, a WASC process. And, and this was, um, I don't know if it was the best I've seen, but it was certainly the most authentic in terms of um, the, the, the WASC visiting committee validating the work of the school. In other words, there, was n there were no surprises. They, they were able to um, reaffirm the work we were doing and, and reaffirm our areas of growth. So this is some of the feedback um, around the middle school that I pulled out because there was a lot of, um, the, the, the visiting committee really recognized that the strength of this community, the strength of our instructional program, um, as Ben has mentioned, is, is really teacher leadership teacher leadership and teacher collaboration and how important that is at a school like ours. So there's some of the statements from the visiting um, committee. So um, student achievement, I reviewed some of this data with the board in January. Um, we had 88% of our middle school students that made the honor roll. One third of our students made the highest um, honor roll, the superintendent's honor roll. Um, we had 100% of our students in the fall complete our student-led conferences. That's a really important part of an international baccalaureate middle years program curricula because it demonstrates that the students understand um, what they're learning, why they're learning, it helps them connect with parents, and it helps deepen their understanding of the IB program. Um, also, um, after our first iteration of Digital Days, and again, this gets back to student support, um, the, the teacher leadership structure in the middle school within a few days had developed a productivity chart. So in other words, each, um, each team of grade level teachers started to track student progress. Um, you know, who had turned in assignments, who was missing assignments, students they had made contact with, students that, that, were, that were missing. And so as a result of these account the, produ the productivity system, at the end of the first iteration of Digital Days, the middle school team made the decision or, or basically ask the question, what if 100% of middle, middle school students were going to be accountable for their digital learning and we were gonna make sure that everybody got their work done? So, so again, this mindset that, um, that we're not gonna let anyone fail. So, so that because of digital learning, no student is gonna end up with a worse grade. Does that make sense? So we were able to get 100% of our students' work turned in from digital days. Maybe not quite 100, but almost there. And it took a lot of work. Teachers were contacting parents. Um, we had makeup sessions at lunch and after school, but we managed to, get the, to send the message to the middle school students that every piece of work matters, whether we're in school or we're on digital days. And then um, our final piece of accountability for the middle school will be in our, obviously in our June report cards that are so important to the MYP and our NWEA map testing in May. So um, in terms of curriculum instruction, again, um, and the strategic plan in middle school, uh, there's full international baccalaureate and middle years program alignment at KAS. 
This is so important for that international standard. So I, I talked about this briefly in January with the board that, okay, so 88% of our students are on the honor roll. So that means we better check our rigor. We wanna make sure that our students are being held to a very high standard and that there's not, you know, grade inflation, that we, can, that we, we know that our assessments are reliable. So, um, so MYP and IB help us do that because that is an international program, an international standard with international requirements that are reviewed uh, periodically. We collected 100% of our course overviews and course syllabi. So we were able to determine in the, not only in the middle school, but grades six through 10, the middle years program, according to IB, every single um, topic that's being taught in a given subject area and exactly how we're assessing those topics. So if you can imagine a map of literally every single topic that's being taught in every subject, in every grade level, six through 10, and how we are assessing that knowledge. So a very powerful um, first step towards creating a published curriculum. The next step has been to literally co collect every single unit plan and lesson plan that's being taught at KAS grades six through 10. To really have a published curriculum that we can then take through a curriculum review cycle. We can determine, as Jesse mentioned, what standards are being taught, when they're being taught, what we're expecting at the end of each grade level in terms of articulation, and then how we're assessing all of that learning. So, so that's been an exciting process that has been fully launched. I'd say we're about 85% um, completed in our initial um, curriculum publishing. Okay, so then um, finally, I do wanna talk about um, student support. And this is so important in middle school because um, middle school, we do have a little bit of flexibility. You know, um, middle school can be about, um, you know, the whole school is about relationships and about making connections with students. But between middle school and high school, there's a pretty intense um, spike in the rigor as students are taking college preparatory classes. So, so middle school becomes really urgent to make sure kids are lifted up and ready for that next step in high school. So in middle school, we have a grade level structure. So um, teachers are organized by grade level teams, six, seven, eight, and those teams meet on a regular basis. And the primary goal of those grade level teams is to talk about student achievement, to look at student work, to, to identify who's struggling and determine what approach, um, supports are appropriate. So, so for example, in the classroom, teachers have something called behavior logs. That means that any time in the moment, if they have a concern about a student, they just make a, a doc, uh, they write it in a, in a shared document. So that way afterwards, the grade level team along with the counselor, along with the administrator, we can, we, can, um, we can look at that data and see if any students are really standing out. It helps remind us of who, you know, who we're worried about in class. And then um, at the same time, our counseling department, so far this year, has had over 250 one-to-one -one meetings with students for any reason that students might need. That's appointments, that's drop-in, that's working with some of our um, contractor partners that provide um, counseling services to students. Um, this year we added a, um, a Chinese language counseling service um, for our students. So, so a lot of initial interactions that help us determine who, who do we need to really um, hone in on and, and provide additional support? So our, our teachers meet on a, on a weekly basis in student support teams. So far this year, we've had 23 student support uh, meetings where we focused on 36 students across three grade levels. So these are the names that come up where we see that students are struggling for any number of reasons, academically or in terms of their social emotional well-being. And in those meetings, that's where we coordinate our strategies around working with those students. So that something that's working in math class can maybe be applied to the English class. So that teachers are communicating in such a way that, that they're working together to support the individual student. And from that, um, at the very sort of top of the triangle, right now we have four students in middle school that have learning plans. So that's a published plan that we um, attached to a, a student that may be struggling, that follows them through the rest of their time at KAS, that, that goes even deeper into designing strategies to support the student, modifying the curriculum, um, documenting ways to differentiate and to make accommodations for one student in particular, because the goal is that IB diploma. 
to take a student at any level and really lift them up so they can achieve that, that highest um, diploma that KAS offers. So at the, at the same time, in terms of citizenship, we have our advisory program in middle school, um, our big time in advisory. We um, do stu student surveys. They tell us what topics they're interested in. The teachers themselves have designed advisory curriculum for grades six, seven, th six, seven and eight. Um, we've had 17 advisory lessons so far this year, and they are customized by grade level. They're developed by our teachers, and these are some of the topics that students identified um, that we have taught two students in advisory classes once a week. Also, big time is uh, a time we use for our assemblies, student recognition, um, our course selection for the next year, our house competitions, student-led clubs, guest speakers, performances, etc. So really trying to get at those, um, the strategic plan for KAS and really you know, thinking about that evidence and, and how we can take that individual student and again, um, lift them up to our highest standard. Okay, so um, that's all I have to say on this this evening. Um, I also want to express gratitude tonight to the board, Dr. Pluger, for bringing me here to Taiwan this year with my family. It's been a great experience. I also want to um, express my gratitude to my principal colleagues, also to the business office, the support staff. Um, it's a really wonderful team of people to be working with. It really has been a pleasure. So thank you very much, and here is Don Rock. Good evening, everyone. I'll almost there. Okay, we'll get there one day. Let's keep at it. So, um, my name is Don Rock. Um, I think everybody here probably already knows that, but um, I'm really happy to be here tonight. And I'm um, a little bit amazed that it's been 13 years now here at KS. Um, uh, Daisy, you can't clap at that. You beat me. <laughs> Ellen beats me too, actually. <laughs> um, and actually, Eric beats me. <laughs> and Denny, right? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not the, not the oldest one here. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very grateful to have my son go to, to KS since he was in pre-K. Um, it's been um, a tremendous gift to my family to have him be educated here at KS, and we're really happy for that. And it's um, one of the driving reasons why we've stayed for as long as we have, because we know that this school pr provides excellent education for its students. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach this evening with what we're going to talk about. I want to come back to the WASP visit again um, and highlight a few more things about it. First of all, many um, board members were able to participate in a in a session with the with the visiting committee, and so I want to say thank you very much for your participation. It's very important that the visiting team hears that particular voice so they understand where the governance is coming from and the, healthy, and the nature of the relationship between the board and the superintendent. So um, I thank you for your participation with that. They were very happy and they did note that um, the board does a very good, has a very good understanding of their role in delegating day-to-day -day operations to the superintendent and his staff. So that's very, very good. Um, I also want to reiterate something that Barnaby said about the team's affirmation of our areas of strength and our areas for growth. Ben read out to many of the areas of strength and growth that the team noted in their visit. And I wanna reiterate that those, most of those were areas that we ourselves had identified. So we went through an 18 month process where we identified what we believed are our greatest areas of strength and our greatest areas for growth. And for the most part, everything that the the team said in their report were things that we had already identified. So that's a very good thing. It means that we took a good, healthy, honest critique of ourselves, and that's what we need. Um, the action plan will be coming soon, the school-wide action plan that leads from those school-wide areas for growth. And I wanna also point out, Ben mentioned that it will align with the board goals and with the Vision 2030. It also needs to align with the MYP and DP action plans which um, have been developed so far, but need to be all integrated together. So I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit more in a moment. And drive going forward for the duration of the plan, that action plan will drive all of our school improvement processes. So it'll be um, an important way for us to stay focused with what our goals are. You may or may not remember <laughs> that originally the WASC team was actually supposed to be here at the same time as the MYP team and the DP team 
It was supposed to be a joint visit from all three agencies. MYP and DP decided to cancel out because of travel restrictions. We were very grateful that we were able to continue on with the WASC portion of the visit, but MYP and DP will now be rescheduled for the fall. So good news and bad news. Um, we'll actually look a lot better than what our reports say because we're gonna actu actually end up with about seven or eight extra months. Um, the plan was, I mean, the report was finished back in January. Now they're gonna come in probably September or October, maybe November. So that'll be both a challenge and an advantage for us um, in that we will have changed quite a, quite a lot since then. It, it, the nature of the IB visits is a bit different. So if you are a parent who's asked to come to sit on some groups for those visits, you're gonna see that it's a little bit different. They're looking a lot at their requirements and their specific program needs and whether we are in al alignment with them. WASC is much more open-ended. WASC allows us to define what, what it is that we want to achieve and they wanna see if we're being true to that. For MYP and DP, they'll be much more um, looking for specific things against specific criteria but we're in good shape for all of those. So we'll see, um, <laughs> we'll see what travel restrictions look like and what freedom of movement looks like come September, but um, we haven't heard yet about when we'll hear. Um, I wanna go back one slide and I'm gonna guess I do that by pressing that, okay. Well, I wanna say one other thing um, about this. The end result of an accreditation cycle is a new s accreditation cycle, a, a status for the next six years depending on where we are. We will find that out by the end of June. Okay, so the team makes their recommendation to the commission back in California, but they do not tell us what their recommendation is. We will hear back from the commission at the end of June. So, by the way, there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> um, I also wanna tell you a little bit about IB and AP exams and what the status of those are at this point. I'm sure most people have heard about these, but I just want to re reiterate what exactly is happening with these. Speaking of things being canceled, all IB exams have been canceled around the world. Um, instead, the IB will be looking at other components of the student's work in order to give them IB grades. So they will still get IB grades. It changed the nature of what we had to submit to them a little bit. Rather than just a sample of some student work, we had to send in all student work. And so our, our teachers had to scramble a little bit to get that prepared based on some changing deadlines, but we are all good now. All of the deadlines for that was on Monday, so everything's set. The students will still receive their results in July as they do in any other year, okay? AP exams are a bit different. They will continue. Um, we are working on, if you have any students or if you've heard anything about this, they are using a US-based schedule, which means that for us, um, some of the exams, they are between midnight and 4 a.m. And all of the schools in Asia are working as hard as we can to pressure the college board, which runs AP, to change that schedule for other time zones around the world, because um, clearly, that's not great, <laughs> it puts us at a disadvantage. And I just found out today actually that one of those exams is the night of the prom. <laughs> so I had a student say, does this mean I have to go from the prom and then go take an exam at 2 a.m.? Um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> should be great. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be at your best. <laughs> um, it's AP Computer Science, just if anybody's wondering. <laughs> Um, so these exams uh, will now actually will happen at home online and will be much shorter in nature, but we'll still give um, the same kind of AP results. What everybody wants to know is how our university is gonna look at the results of these um, scores this year, given the completely different nature of them. To date, as far as we understand, universities are going to honor those results the same as they would any other year. So that's good news. Um, especially actually, and even though the schedule's awful for AP exams, they're much shorter and with reduced content. So I'm telling the students, go for it. You, you don't have anything to lose at all. So that's where we are with those. And I know those are weighing on students' minds quite a lot. Um, supporting our seniors. So I have to say at this point that I've been so incredibly impressed with the maturity of our students this semester. Every time I have to announce that another thing has been canceled, you know, they, they, they take it so well. 
They, they understand that it's not us. They really are grateful to be in Taiwan as opposed to just about anywhere else on the planet right now. And they've taken it in stride. So I'm very, very proud of them. And um, from our end, we have a group of dedicated teachers who want to do everything we can to give them some of those fun things that they remember at the end of their senior year, right? The things that you remember the most about graduating from high school, they usually happen in those last couple of months right before graduation. So we're trying to keep those going as much as we can. So in no particular order. We will have a prom. It won't involve any dancing. <laughs> because they're trying to imagine dancing with masks on. So they're, they, um, they've, I've encouraged them to sort of embrace the, the, awkward, the quirkiness of this year and do something, you know, do something fun, make it, shake it up a bit. We're going to have it here on campus. It'll be in our dining hall. Um, and what they mostly want to do is take pictures, right? Like this is what they want to do anyway. The dancing sort of secondary. Just let's take lots of pictures of my pretty dress. So that's still going to happen. It's going to happen on May 15th. Um, the 11th grade members of the student council are hard at work planning that for the seniors. Another bit, one of our traditions every year is the senior lunch, which is usually the day before graduation. It will be the day before graduation. So we will have our senior lunch on May 16 here at school. So we'll be able to continue that tradition. Usually we, we take them out for a nice meal in a restaurant. We're bringing in, bringing in a nice meal here for them instead. Senior project. I think Ben mentioned that for the most part, those are canceled. Those were service projects that would happen in schools and other locations. And unfortunately, you know, they're being cautious and they don't want to have outsiders on their sites for that time. There is one that right now, might still be going on. That's a trip to Shaliocho for um, ocean an ocean conservation pro project. project. Um, but that's it. And then graduation. Yay, graduation. <laughs> we are reimagining graduation to hold it outdoors so that we can comply with social distancing guidelines here in Taiwan and to account for potential rain because it, it's in May. <laughs> so we've got a, a group of teachers working on rethinking through the entire ceremony and what we might do. It is at 9 a.m. in our courtyard. Um, we will have limited attendance compared to some years in order to make sure we have uh, under the cap amount of the number of people that we can have. So that's all still going on. I, the seniors themselves have also planned a few other things. Oh, I, oh, one other thing I didn't put up here. We're also gonna hold a series of sort of real life seminars for the seniors after they're finished with courses, but before they have graduation. So we have um, a, a seminar on some basic cooking ideas. How do you cook in a dorm? Okay. <laughs> that was really popular, actually. The kids really want to know this one. Um, there's another one on some basic auto maintenance. Like, how do you change oil? <laughs> no, no, we're not going to do that. Sorry. Change a tire. That's much easier. <laughs> um, we're going to do some basic things that they're taking care of cars, um, having good relationships on university campus, campus services, and what's available to them. And um, the most popular one that they chose was actually personal finance. They want to know about, about how to keep a budget, what taxes are like, you know, all these kind of basic things regarding personal finance. So we have different teachers who are offering up those sessions, and um, we hope that they'll, they'll find it engaging. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, what, as Ken mentioned, we did, we have lost two students this year. Most recently, a student in the high school passed away this past weekend. And I just wanted to talk about a little bit about what we're doing right now to support her friends and classmates. We're primarily focusing on ninth grade students, although there are several eighth grade students involved in some of the activities as well, because she was friends with them as well. We are increasing the use of our therapists so that they're on campus more often and they're working with small indi uh, individual kids and small groups as needed. We are, um, we have spent some time giving the students time and space to reflect, to write memories and prayers and thoughts for her family. Um, we have some students who are making videos to put together into a compilation as a memorial for her. And more, more than everything, we are encouraging our community members to be nice to each other and nice to themselves as they go through this. So um, again, this, this adds, it, it, this is always the, the difficult. Having this on top of the worldwide stress at the same time has been a particular challenge. 
Um, so we're all here to support our students with that. So thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, thank you, board of directors, uh, principals, Candy, all of our uh, parents who are in attendance tonight. I really appreciate all of you making it out here, especially under the circumstances that we have to go through with masks and social distancing, and it really means a lot to us to, to have you here. Uh, my name is Brian Meehan. I'm proud to be the director of learning technology here at KAS. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do here in technology. KAS is literally swimming in connectivity. Thousands of gigabytes of data traverse our networks. Every day, over 1,500 devices connect to our network. Taiwan is home to some of the fastest internet speeds in the world, and our students enjoy that in every single classroom on campus. And while our team ensures the robust reliability of every network switch, wireless access point, router, and server, the most important connection of all is the human connection. On behalf of Mr. Robert Chuang, Ms. Lena Wong, and myself, we are proud to help KAS create more human connections through technology. Communication is an integral part of the fabric that brings our community together. We give students a voice from software technologies that enable ELL students to become more proficient English speakers, to differentiation solutions that amplify even the softest voices. Being a strong communicator runs through our big mission. When students collaborate, the sum is greater than the whole. It's truly a blessing to witness students demonstrate mastery of a subject that they, that they um, de when they collaborate and teach each other, uh, teach it to another student or even a teacher about something they're passionate about. And our teachers collaborate too. This year, the KAS Technology Ambassadors, even in the face of social distancing and digital days, managed to lead five after-school training sessions for their colleagues. This led to the use of AR and VR in classroom projects in middle school and high school, and a new feedback program in high school English. Our students grow with or without us. My food and clothing cost at home for a teenager tells me this is true. KAS grows too. It grows young minds and connects them to new ideas. Technology enables this. Technology also helps KAS to grow into a bigger and stronger community. This year, KAS migrated to a new admission software. We focused on an improved user experience to make families feel welcome at first click. Our open apply dashboard ensures that we're able to attract and admit students who are the best fit for KAS and for whom KAS is the right fit for them. We gain stronger insight to our wait list and our pipeline. KAS is poised for growth and technology connects us to the data that proves it. We started this year with a new format and platform for our school newsletter, Reborn as Dragon's Tale. This more interactive platform helps engage our parents and extended community and increases the visibility of on-site events like this afternoon's college application process hosted by our counseling suite, suddenly we could connect with our community in a new and more powerful, not to mention measurable way. But we didn't stop there. Over the winter break, we launched a newly updated Dragon Gate and Dragon Gate Student. This, these information portals provide a connection for students, staff, and faculty to the myriad of data and software that makes our school work. 
They especially help our newest employees and students feel welcome by putting the essential information you need just a few clicks away. We're excited to share that our next project is our public facing website at kas.tw, which is scheduled for completion over the summer. At KAS, we're driven to bring the best experience for our students and families. Each year brings new ways to enrich the technology integration at our school. And in the 1920 school year, there was no exception. For starters, in order to keep up with the life cycle of classroom equipment, we schedule a cascade of key components, like focusing on a certain per percentage each year. In this school year, 25% of our Apple TVs were updated to the latest 4K capable versions. We replaced 16% of our projectors. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make you do any math. Uh, which have a reliable life of around six years. And it goes on like this for faculty and staff, laptops and desktops and phones and all that stuff. But we don't stand by on, on this. We don't sit around on our laurels. We're focused on improvements. We're also expanding our offerings. This year we found our office being requested for more and more live streaming of events on campus, like meetings, sporting events, uh, student performances. Rather than rent a device each time, we researched and then invested in a broadcast solution that allows up to three cameras simultaneously with a director coordinating a production that can be live streamed to multiple internet sources. Tonight's meeting is using that hardware right now. So I'd like to take a moment to say hello to all our families at home. We currently have 24 live stream viewers. Uh, uh, thank you for tuning in and uh, thank you for Kel to Kelsey for manning the control booth right now. So we have to talk about COVID-19 for a moment. Semester two. A lot of schools around the world say, what semester two? But here in Taiwan, in Kaohsiung, at KAS, we were the only school open on February 13th. We were the first school in Taiwan to switch our classes online on January 30th. That's a big difference. Because of this, our students have more classroom engagement time than students anywhere else in the world. It's not just an email to assign some homework. It was inspiring to witness teachers working together, learning new software, techniques, and methods to reach students in their homes. It's not just a different location, it's a different way of teaching. Our resilient faculty, whom I've humbled to work among, dare to take risks, try new things, and push themselves and their students to extraordinary results. It's a lot of work though. It's hard to breathe through a mask too. Um, we've had daily response team meetings. We built an efficient temperature tracking system for morning arrivals. I would put our data and our procedures up against any other school on the, on the island. We are definitely doing it better. We've helped families determine when it was safe to return to school after travel. We've enabled live events and online meetings. We're recording and editing student performances in lieu of auditorium shows. We are remaining vigilant to security pitfalls as bad actors try to take advantage of the worldwide situation. We're delivering on new training tools and we're ensuring the school has access to all the tools being offered by generous companies to the affected schools and students. This is your team here. The mission of the KAS Learning Technology Office is to provide a robust and secure technology environment to support the academic mission of the Kaohsiung American School. This is achieved through end user support to our faculty, staff, and students and community members. In-person classroom support, one-to-one uh, -one cl classroom support and demonstrations, event planning, support, live streaming, ongoing wide-ranging professional development sessions, strategic planning for future technology initiatives and school growth, systems automation, vendor negotiation and procurement, nego network infrastructure planning and maintenance, and communications design and support. I'm gonna leave you with one thing. I finished my presentation last year with a year up on there. And it was the year that the pre-K would have graduated, it was 2032. This year, I wanna take a look at the year 2007. Our middle school students are the first generation born since the launch of the iPhone. But we've got to be careful not to use that to judge or measure them. It does them a disservice to refer to them as digital natives. As educators, our job is to guide them to be future leaders by building in them 
a deep capacity for learning and for empathy. The iPhone changed the world. Sure, yeah, we had digital organizers and cell phones and internet access prior to the iPhone, but it was this turning point that suddenly the whole of humanity's information was available in your pocket. I'm sorry, Miss Collette, my ninth grade math teacher, but yes, in 2020, all of us do walk around with a calculator in our pocket and a periodic table and the entire Encyclopedia Britannica and every photo we've ever taken and every song we've ever loved. KAS is the right place for these students to learn, to grow, and to change both themselves and the world around them. They'll use technology to connect with their thoughts, with their peers, and with individuals all over this tiny blue planet. They have to. Our lives depend on it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the AGM. I'm Danny, um, the treasurer of the board. Now is the finance committee report. First of all, I would like to show you the independent auditor's report from KPMG. I will re read along with their report. In our opinion, the company's financial statement presents fairly in all material respects. The financial position of the school of June 30, 2019 and 2018, and the East statement of activity and the East cash flow for the year then and in ac according with the regulation governing auditing and the certification of finance financial statement by certificate public accountants and the auditing standard generally accept in Republic of China, as well as enterprise accounting standard and the layer relate, related interpretation announced by the Accounting Research and the Development Foundation of the Republic of China. This report show, show us our business activity in the campus all comply with the relevant government law and the regulation. Okay, next page. How did we do this year? Original in enrollment present in April 2019 AGM was uh, 735 paid students. However, the real number for the the first semester, it increased to 744 students. And uh, the second semester increased to 763 students. This result in an increased revenue of 40 million. What, what do we do this year? Operating expense saving for 20 million is mainly, mainly from careful spending management, and the personal cost, and the office supplies. Uh, this excellent management is because we have a great leadership of superintendents and his team. However, uh, the board also suggests a rest of the personal expense may be essential for quality education. Now we have a look of the budget for the next year. Uh, we make a budget for uh, enrollment for 745 for the full years. I believe the actual number will be more than that. And um, we have a tuition fee increase by 2.65%. This will lead to total expendable income increase 11 million. And uh, the majority expense increase um, 
for the first one, the personal cost is about 2%. It will lead to 4.5 million. And the professional development, 66%, it will be 1.7 million. And the, the third one is the building maintenance, it's about 23%. It will increase 1.4 million. So the total operating expense increase 30 million for the next year. Now we have a look of the uh, 2020 and 2021 budget. Uh, please look at the table that we compared 2020-2021 uh, to the previous year 2019 and uh, 2020. The enrollment uh, number will be um, seven, 745. Compared to the pre previous years, it, it's a 10 student increase. And uh, the expandable income is 380 million compared to the previous year is 11 million increased. And uh, the total operating expense is 288 million. And compared to the previous year is also increased 30 million. And contingency funds for 2020 and 2021 is 5.7 million. It's uh, 0 0.2 million increase. So the outcome will be a uh, 24.3 million. It's, if we compare to the previous year, it's just about 2.2 million. It's just slightly different, not too much. Uh, finally, I would like to reiterate what I said last year. Our financial status is robust and healthy as long as we have st stable enrollment numbers. Uh, currently, the student numbers are reaching a record height. And uh, there are so many outsiders are waiting for entry. Um, I think the nice reputation of KS has been created, and uh, this is a great achievement of all the members in our community. Furthermore, we have also accumulate sufficient contingency fund and the, the capital reserve to cope with the unexpected situation. I also like to take this opportunity to show my gratitude for the support of the board. Besides the superintendent, Ben, and the, the business, business manager, Candy, and the rest of the staff in the business office. Because of their dedication and the tireless effort to make our finance always in good shape, please give them the applause. <laughs> it's really good. Once again, uh, thanks to everybody for coming to the AGN. If there is, is an increase, there are any question or suggestion about our financial matter. Uh, Please feel free to come to me to see me. Thank you. All second? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, geez. Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Thank you for playing along at home. Um, I'm going to give a quick, my name is Matt O'Connor. I'm a vice chair of the board and I'm the head of the nomination committee. And I'll give a quick update on um, what we're doing this year. Um, as you may or may not know, we have seven appointed members. I'm sorry, seven elected members of the board. They're elected from everyone who's eligible, which is the parents. Um, and we have an, uh, someone from AIT. Uh, and that's me. And we have an appointed member of the board who is Corey Pavicic. Um, 
So this year we decided to reappoint Corey to the board. Um, uh, he works for a company called Noodle, or does he own a company called, is that his? He works for Noodle. They do online um, education solutions for universities. So we thought that was a great skill set to keep on for another year. Uh, as for the AIT member, I am leaving this year, I think. Um, and we will have a new person come and replace me. And then that leaves the seven elected members. Um, this year we have none up for election. Next year we will have four up for election. Um, however, we did have one member who was no longer eligible to serve. This was um, J. Joe because his child did not go to the school anymore. We appointed another member, um, Wang Yimbing, over here, um, who is to, to fill out the rest of the, that person's term. Now we're losing Mr. Wang, Dr. Wang, um, because his daughter is graduating. Uh, so to fill out the final year of the three-year term, um, we asked for uh, some members of the eligible community to apply. So on March 13th, we sent an email out to everyone, and uh, we got some very strong candidates. And at the last nomination committee meeting, we chose um, someone to fill out that last year of J. Joe's original term, and that is Susanna Ye, who is here with us here tonight. Uh, and she will finish out the term. Um, uh, and we will have the election again at the next annual general meeting next year for four seats. Um, she, uh, Susanna will come to the June board meeting. She'll be an observer. And then she and then Corey as well will be sworn in again at the first meeting before the start of the school year. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Hello. Sorry, and that concludes the, the AGM for tonight. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and everybody at home for joining us. And we'll see you soon. Thank you.